So as Dr. Pierce noted, while the title says getting undergraduates interested, it really is about both the undergraduates and the graduate students. So the projects that I'll be talking about today are in conjunction with Dr. Belford and students in the IOST lab. So let me start out with uh, what the future looks like in terms of job growth uh, in this area. Let's see if my slide transition goes. Yep, got it, okay. And so here we are uh, in uh, 2021 and notice that there's quite a bit of projected growth for, for IOT in general uh, for the future. Lots of potential job opportunities are at least projected for now and, and likely to be uh, uh, very, very uh, lucrative kinds of jobs as well. So here is what we see for IOT in general. Let's now look at the biology side. So for life science jobs, notice that computer and information research scientist is in the top six for life science jobs. And if you imagine then that there could be some synergism between the, uh, the life science jobs and the IoT jobs, then there could be even more opportunities for, for uh, good employment in, the, in this area. So I come from bioinformatics and one of the terms we use in bioinformatics is domain knowledge. So in bioinformatics, an example of domain knowledge might be uh, a experience with say, long non-coding uh, RNAs, microRNAs, or brain imaging kinds of things. The things that might uh, help a, uh, a prospective uh, person looking for a job to uh, stand out in the crowd, the, the domain uh, knowledge area. So the same could be true for the IoT side. Uh, if people have experience in IoT, whether it be the communication side, the data an analysis side, these could also uh, influence their ability to stand out in the crowd when they're job hunting. So I've listed some of what we think are the, uh, the classic bio I IoT kinds of things. And with all computer types of uh, areas that we have today, there's, there's always a, a big concern about cybersecurity. So I have to point out that at least for the implanted medical devices, there's certainly a very much of a concern for cybersecurity as pointed out by this slide right here. So this is the, uh, the, the pacemaker and certainly there are uh, cybersecurity issues for the pacemaker. So one way to get students of all types interested in this is to talk about what their fellow students are doing in terms of uh, bio uh, IoT research. So I've listed some students here that, I'm, that I've worked with uh, no, in no specific order, uh, but I do have to point out that some are graduate students, some are undergraduates, and some started out as graduate students, some started out as undergraduates, and then became graduate students in this area. So for the students then, imagine these are people that you might know or you might could come become a student just like this. So now I want to talk about the why do we care uh, aspect uh, of the, uh, the, the bio IoT. Here's why we care. Turns out that more than $47 million worth of food are destroyed by insects. That's 37%. That's an amazing large number of food uh, that's being impacted by insect damage. On the other side of that, there's 25 billion spent on pesticides every year. So imagine if they weren't uh, spending 25 billion, then there could be more than 37% uh, food loss here. So it's really significant in terms of cost. And also notice that for the 25 billion spent on pesticides, then this requires more than 10 billion uh, to respond to the health and environmental impacts of spraying poisons into the environment. So the solution then potentially is the solar red unit, what I describe as an agricultural sized bug zapper. 
So notice that we have uh, a solar panel here. It's turned towards the sun, so we don't see the, the solar panel side of it. But here we have a solar panel that's keeping the battery charged up. And the, then the, the battery can provide a voltage to do the, to the killing grid. So here we have a killing grid. What I really like about this particular picture is the collection bag. So notice we have a collection bag here. So as the insect uh, impacts the killing grid uh, and gets zapped, it will drop through the chute and go into the collection bag. So here is the opportunity to collect samples of the insects that are being impacted uh, by this device. Also, what I really like about this particular idea is that what they can do then is collect these insects and feed them, those zapped insects, and feed them to the chickens or feed them to the fish. So I really like the idea here that instead of having the insects eat our food, we can turn them into food for fish or chickens. That's a cool idea. So instead of negatively impacting the food, they can more positively impact our food. So a lot of this is about food security, which is a very important area nowadays. So the way this works is they're going to, the, the device will attract the insects to it. Now you can see here's a picture of the device running at night. Notice that there are lights here. So they use lights to attract the insects to the killing grid. They use sounds and there are a variety of buzzing sounds that the unit will put out uh, to attract the insects. Also notice that there are pheromones and food smells. So there's a little chamber inside here uh, where a, uh, the chemicals, pheromones and, fo and food sample uh, smells can be put into this unit. And then a fan can blow these smells out uh, of the, uh, in the front of the killing grid to attract the insects to the killing grid. So the main question here, can bio IoT sensors be developed that recognize zapped insect attributes? And so what we mean by uh, zapped insect attributes are the size, the egg laying condition, and the general species uh, group recognition. Now we don't really expect that with this, these kinds of sensors that we'll be able to recognize insects at the species level. We are hoping that we can uh, at least recognize general species groups here, which could be very important by itself. So what we did uh, over the summer was get some army worm pupa. And so what Dr. Belford did was to then lay out the pupa onto uh, this plate with uh, shredded paper and allow them to finish their, uh, their process and emerge. And then we were, the idea was to test our ability to collect data as they're being zapped by the, uh, the killing grid. So that leads us to the instrument. This is the main instrument that we use. It's not the only one, but it is the main instrument. This is a microcomputer. We also use microcontrollers like the Arduino and other kinds of microcontrollers. It's an amazing little device. Uh, notice the, uh, the cost. So one way uh, that we get students interested in this is not only by showing what fellow students are doing, but also showing the low cost of entry into this area. So you can see that it's really quite reasonably priced to be able to get a device like this and start collecting data. Now, of course, there are uh, sensors to go with this. We find that uh, this, often the sensors are also very reasonably priced. So I'm going to go into uh, some of the, uh, the pinouts on this. Now, the Raspberry Pi uh, is really very similar to, to my cell phone. I believe when I compare the CPU of the Raspberry Pi, it's identical to the CPU on my phone. My phone might be a little bit cheaper than, than some of the others. And so you can imagine then for the Raspberry Pi, we have access to these pens to uh, then interface a variety of sensors. For my phone, those pens are already commandeered to the phone functions but ideally it's very similar. So notice we have 3.3 uh, volts, we have five volts, we have the ground, and we have the GPIO 
digital pins. So we'll look at the digital pins in a little bit more detail. So we have the UART. This is the classic COM port that we used to see uh, in some of the older computers. Uh, also, this is called the RS-232 uh, for uh, basic communication for uh, some instruments. And so for the cell phone analogy, it might be, it's very likely that your cell phone is using this very same kind of communications protocol to do its communication for the cell phone job. Here we have pinouts uh, and we can actually plug in which, uh, something called a, uh, a phono breakout board, which is uh, essentially a, uh, just like a cell phone. It's a electronic board you put in the SIM card and allows you to then access the cell phone data through your Raspberry Pi, just like you would on a cell phone. Some of these other uh, interface methods, uh, I2C and SPI are, are things I've never seen before until I started using the, the Raspberry Pi. And now I have experience with, with both of these kinds of uh, interfacing methods and other kinds of methods for uh, interfacing instruments. Also, the Raspberry Pi, just like a cell phone, the Raspberry Pi can uh, have a, uh, a camera. And so it's very easy to, uh, to connect the camera to the Raspberry Pi. There's a dedicated port for this ribbon cable. Very easy to plug in the camera to the Raspberry Pi. And so what we want to do here as we collect the attributes, the attributes of the, uh, the bug zapping we also want to collect pictures of the zap, the bug being before zap, during zap, and after zap, so that we can correlate the actual uh, picture of the, the bug in terms of what it is by size, by species, with the data we collect from that. Another way to get students interested uh, in uh, the bio IoT is the uh, introduction of the 3D printer uh, to the mix here. So some students may have experience in 3D printing and think, well, they have something to bring to the table in terms of uh, expertise to, to this field or students that want to gain expertise in this field. So one of the things that, that I found in terms of my uh, early computer days is I learned programming and this gave me a hunger for things to do. So I then sought out projects. As an undergraduate, I uh, went to see a chemistry professor because the chemistry professor had interesting things to do in terms of data science and programming. And so that could be the same thing here for the 3D printer. They may have 3D printing skills and they want a place to apply those skills. So the idea here is that we can not only do 3D printing for uh, the mounts for the camera, but also for uh, custom sensor mounts. So this is another way of getting students interested in the bio IoT world. So now we can start talking about the actual data collection. So this is a setup that Dr. Belford uh, built. Uh, and so let me start out with, uh, this is a screened in uh, container. We have the solar rig uh, inside here. It could be left open uh, for attracting wild insects. So we could collect data on wild insects, or we could put the pupa in here to emerge. We could collect data on known insects. All we have to do is put them inside and close it up. So notice that we have the Raspberry Pi connected here. And so we have wires that come from the solar unit. And these wires are giving us a, a specific type of data that we're going to try and, and use to improve our data collection. So here is uh, an example of that. And I want to point out that this is uh, a, an R Shiny app uh, that student uh, Hunter Tinner developed. And it's a very nice way of quickly evaluating the data that we gather from this instrument. So what's going on here is that there are, there are two things happening. In order to zap the bug, a, uh, a capacitor needs to be charged up to deliver uh, a high voltage to the killing grid. And there needs to be a circuit 
that can then bring the recharge that capacitor. Every time it gets uh, a discharge, it needs to very quickly be recharged. So what we're looking at here, notice uh, this first uh, blue line here, notice a slight little wobble as it goes along. So this is likely due to what's called a bleed circuit. This could be used for uh, as a safety feature. Uh, potentially when you turn the unit off, we want that killing grid to quickly bleed off and discharge so it would be safe to, to move. And so over very quickly over time, it's gonna bleed off. This circuit follows the, uh, the charging. We call this the sawtooth. So when the capacitor is fully charged, the charging circuit shows that there's nothing uh, being charged. There's no need to charge. The capacitor is topped off. But as it then bleeds off, we, it ramps up the, the recharge. And when it gets uh, high enough, it slows down the recharging and then it stops uh, charging when it gets to, to full capacity. And this uh, continues with this characteristic sawtooth. Now, when there's a discharge, uh, and in this case, we see a very deep downward spike to indicate that the capacitor was uh, deeply discharged and a very high recharging spike as well. So the idea here is we, we think we can use this kind of data to uh, let us know that we've got a a, uh, an insect that's been uh, zapped, and we use this to trigger the data collection. And I'll show you what we mean by, by data collection. So Hunter developed this gas sensor ar array. So let me talk about this array, and then we'll talk about how it's used. So these are relatively inexpensive sensors. And so uh, these are gas sensors. And how these work is that there's a heating element uh, in, inside here. And when the gas then uh, gets burned by this heating element, it changes the, uh, the conductivity. And so that conduct the conductivity then is used to produce the data that would re relate to the gases, uh, the particular gases that this sensor will uh, be sensitive to. So some are sensitive to uh, a more narrow range of gases, some are sensitive to a broader range. They're fairly inexpensive, but collectively, this data could be very useful for uh, potentially recognizing uh, gases. And so what I'm gonna show now is some of the data that Hunter has provided by some of his uh, experimental work that he's done. So in developing the gas, uh, the sensor array, he's used some, uh, some material of known outcome. So I have to point out that acetone and ethanol are very different chemicals. So it should be very easy for a, a gas uh, sensor array like this to, uh, to measure the differences uh, here. And so as you'd expect, the decision tree here is very simple. So what we've got here in this simple decision tree is the gas uh, sensor MQ7 and a particular, so we're, ca we're capturing a data in essentially a time series. And so for the 12th uh, data capture for the MQ7, this seems to be, uh, for, at least for this example, seems to be uh, the one that's used to, uh, to sort out between acetone and ethanol. So here is the machine learning that was done on that. Uh, this is the, um, the training uh, data. So here we have the, the training and uh, what we see is zero errors. So we have zero training errors for this particular run. So we have 22 cases altogether, 11 of ethanol and 11 of acetone, okay? So the important thing here uh, is that this is only training data. Uh, the, the critical uh, information here is the validation. So let's look at the validation. So here we have the validation uh, work. Uh, and again, this is uh, the C5 uh, machine learning application. So what I've done is to uh, use what's called uh, the K-fold. So machine learning, in order to validate, they'll use uh, a K-fold. And that is essentially holding a certain number out 
training with the rest, taking the model that's been trained and applying that model to the, the ones that have not been seen for, for training. We know the outcome, but they've not already been seen for, for training. And so that way we can determine the quality of the uh, predictive model. And so by setting the K-fold to uh, into a leave one out uh, by using this X parameter, I can model a leave one out. So you can see the validation, <clears throat> pardon me, shows that in fact, it's, it's not uh, perfect. So in this example, it was classified uh, as ethanol when it was in fact acetone. So you can see that one from, from acetone got put over in the ethanol area. So I did uh, show the title of this as being a demo, uh, but to, uh, to save time, uh, if people are interested in seeing the, the raw data here uh, and what the raw data looks like in terms of what's required for machine learning and an actual machine learning run, uh, stick around at the end, let me know if you're interested and I will stay and do uh, a demo on the, the actual machine learning side of this. So while this is ethanol and acetone, the good news here is that we have a data type that we, from the, the gas array that we know we can apply machine learning to. So we have some confidence uh, that as we collect data on known uh, insects, that we can uh, attempt to do machine learning to predict uh, the, uh, hopefully the size or maybe the, the general species class of these insects. The idea here is that we want to improve the ability of this uh, solar red unit to target beneficial insects and leave the, uh, the good insects alone. I, I should have pointed out earlier that the, uh, the solar red uh, runs at night. And so the honeybees then are not impacted by this because they don't work at night. Uh, it'll be uh, often the, uh, the moths that would eat the vegetation that would be impacted by this at night. So what we wanna do is continue to find ways of improving the targeting of a unit like this. And this, the gas array data and the machine learning is our, hopefully our method of improving the targeting to avoid uh, harming beneficial insects like the pollinators. So now I'm gonna move on to another project. And again, the idea here is to point out to, to students uh, that these are real world problems that are associated with industry. And this is an opportunity for students to work uh, on cutting edge science that's very relevant to industry. So this is the aquaponics facility. I meant to point out that um, the, the aqua uh, side of this, aqua is for fish farming and the ponics is for uh, growing plants in water. So this is a fish uh, plant uh, closed, somewhat closed ecosystem. I guess we shouldn't call it closed because obviously it's open to the air uh, and evaporation and food is being brought in to this. So it's a circulation. They're circulating the, uh, the fish uh, water uh, in through with the, the plant water. The idea here is that the plants will uh, help filter out uh, the waste from the fish. So here you can see in the greenhouse side of it, uh, there are two uh, uh, growing beds uh, on both sides of the greenhouse. And then here is the, uh, the growing bed on one side. Notice the, the fish tanks. So there are fish tanks uh, in the greenhouse side and also fish tanks in the shipping container side. And so from this view, then behind me, is uh, another set of fish tanks and, and growing beds uh, in the greenhouse. So I wanna bring your attention to this display on the side of the fish tank. And so here it is right here. I do need to point out that uh, this, as you can see, this picture is uh, somewhat old. Uh, this was 
before the pandemic, if I remember correctly, is just a few weeks before uh, the pandemic arrived in Arkansas. So this is one of the few opportunities we had to have this kind of face-to-face -face meeting. This is uh, David Gill, Senior Director of Technology Innovation at Heifer International, and Dr. Belford of uh, Chemistry UA Little Rock, and uh, the leader of the IOST lab here at UA Little Rock. So back to uh, the display here, notice the wires that are going into the fish tank. So they are measuring a variety of par parameters uh, inside uh, the fish tank here. One of those is the pH. And so what goes on here is as they feed the fish, the fish then will, uh, will excrete waste. And ideally the plants will help to filter that waste. But what can happen is the, the plants may not always be able to handle all of that. And what can happen is the, uh, the pH can drift uh, out of optimum. So it can become more acidic. So what they're doing is they're watching the pH. And if the pH then uh, drifts uh, up to uh, a certain level of acidity, then a technician will recognize that because they're checking this meter regularly. And they will go get some material and mix that material into the growing bed and dilute that, <clears throat> pardon me, and then uh, watch for that to adjust the, the pH. So now imagine a scenario where say a Friday afternoon where the technician checks the, the, the meter, says, well, this is starting to drift uh, out of optimum, so it should be fine. So let me just make a mental note here that on Monday morning, I'll come back and check this. And if in fact it's drifted below our target, I'll just go ahead and add some, some material to adjust our pH back to uh, a optimum level. So the technician goes home. Now try to imagine some, some, scenario, some scenario where there's a big snow in Little Rock and Monday morning comes along and the technician can't actually drive into a Heifer International and check the meter. And so, and imagine somehow that that could go on for a couple of days. Now that's not likely this week, but imagine last week, that's really a possibility. And so what can happen here is if they're not able to come in, in and also I must point out that if we had a scenario like this where snow impacted the environment, and we had a lot of clouds, the clouds would impact the ability of the plants to grow. That would impact the ability of the plants to uh, clean the water, which could then cause the acidity, uh, the, the, uh, the pH then to drift even faster uh, away from the optimum. So while on Friday before this, the technician thinks, well, this will be fine until Monday. But then if the snow event comes along, this could drift quite fairly quickly over a few days out of optimum, that could negatively impact the growth of the fish, which would then negatively impact the, the food. So again, we could imagine a scenario that could be detrimental uh, to food security. So that's where this idea comes in. So another way to get students interested uh, in this area is through the Student Signature Experience Grant. So through a grant like this, I was able to buy the peristaltic pump. And here's where the peristaltic pump comes in. So we've already introduced this idea of the need to neutralize acidity and bring back the environment to an optimum level. So here is what we proposed in this grant. What we could do is have a pH meter measuring the acidity in the fish tank. When the acidity goes to a certain level, it could trigger the pump to pump the liquid from the reservoir that's going to help neutralize this into the, the growing bed. And so we could have this on a timer where when the acidity is a certain level, it triggers the pump to come on for a certain length of time, it goes off, we again cycle back around, we check the acidity. If it's still not, not at optimum, we could then again turn on the pump. And so 
when it gets to optimum, the pump no longer is triggered and everything is fine. And this could be uh, a very useful tool for the kind of scenario that you might imagine for a snow incident that I just described. So here's how we would trigger the, the peristaltic pump. Uh, this is a fairly simple device. Uh, what it does, notice the, uh, the green block right here. This is where uh, the Raspberry Pi would uh, give a digital signal. So if a student has the ability to turn on an LED, this is the exact same thing. If they're turning on uh, power to a digital port, which would turn on an LED, it's the same thing to turn on power to a digital port and trigger this relay, which would give power to this outlet, which would turn on the peristaltic pump or turn off the peristaltic pump, just as we described in this scenario. So the challenge here could be the testing of, of something like this. So in the original scenario, we're talking about moving material from this bucket into the, the, the growing bed. So if you're in a lab and you're a student wanting to test your software, your ability to interface the instrument and control instruments, then you want a simpler way to do this. You don't want to have to uh, produce an, an, an acidic environment, deal with uh, chemicals, dumping chemicals, resetting buckets, starting all over. So what I did was propose a very simple technique so what we do is we swap out the pH probe for a temperature sensor. So now in the new scenario, instead of pumping water from bucket A into the reservoir and then having to refill the buckets and dump the, the, the buckets, we circulate the water from the bucket through the peristaltic pump, through a hose, back into the original bucket. So it's self-contained in that area. You can turn it on, let it pump, turn it off, no need to, to dump and start over. You can continue to concentrate on the task at hand, which is the development of the programming code to control this. And so what we do now is run this, the hose through an ice bed. So the water is still uh, self-contained. It doesn't come in contact with the ice water. It just goes through the ice water uh, tray and exchanges heat. So it comes through the, the, the hose back to the reservoir at a cooler temperature. So now instead of using pH as our trigger, we use temperature as our, as our trigger. And so this is a way to very e efficiently uh, test the, uh, our programming methods. Now I think this helps to uh, recruit the students when we can show them that we have complex problems to solve, but we can produce solutions by very simple testing means. So this is a diagram of the, uh, the aquaponics system. It's not to scale. And I've just added a few ideas of probes. We've talked about pH uh, probes in the fish tank, uh, and some are just generic probes that we might consider later on. And so this uh, diagram might build up over time as new ideas emerge, as students come in and with new ideas, we could fill in this, uh, this diagram with whatever appropriate sensors uh, we deem necessary and appropriate for uh, this kind of research. So I want to point out again, some of the research that students have done, because I like this idea of, of getting students uh, interested in this by showing them what fellow students have done. And so this student uh, was very prolific. Uh, let me sh show where uh, the, the student had interfaced the same kinds of waterproof temperature probes that I was pointing out earlier, and also uh, interfacing a, uh, a temperature and humidity probe outside of the tank. So we have humidity and, and temperature outside. We have water temperature. Also notice total dissolved solids uh, in this particular example. And for this probe, it's uh, a USB. So what the student demonstrated was a very, a very thorough skill set of interfacing a variety of probes 
using a, a several different uh, methods uh, uh, in terms of uh, the techniques, uh, including uh, going directly to, to Wi-Fi with uh, some microcontrollers. Also, the students have done an, an amazing job leveraging the ability of the Google Sheets to take on data. This is a technique that I, that I used many years ago, uh, the idea that you can have uh, some formulas that point to cells, and these cells could start out empty. But as you push data to these cells, by whatever means, in the old days, I would have uh, some macros that would read a data file. And so I could just run data files through this uh, spreadsheet and it would push the data into the cells. The formulas would then uh, be, be triggered to calculate that and it could uh, then uh, calculate variety of, of parameters and, and also graph it. And this is, that's the same thing we see here, except the students have added on a fascinating layer where through Wi-Fi, they can then push data into these cells uh, dynamically. And so this is the dashboard uh, that the student developed. Uh, and so this now is, is fully automated uh, and, and I believe running uh, right now, collecting current data uh, in, these, in these aquariums. So it's fascinating how the students ha have leveraged things that they already understand uh, in terms of Google Sheets and how to uh, push data to, to Google Sheets programmatically and automatically. So another thing that we were, were hoping for uh, to get students interested is the idea of going to uh, Heifer International and, and seeing what's going on and, and talking to people. And hopefully that will influence them into the area of bio IoT. And so originally we were trying to get Wi-Fi uh, installed directly in the aquaponics facility. That didn't seem to be working very well. So I proposed uh, producing what I call uh, a Wi-Fi bubble. And so I developed this idea of uh, interfacing some uh, very inexpensive uh, sensors to, uh, ras to the Raspberry Pi Zero. So this is a much smaller, uh, lighter weight uh, version of the Raspberry Pi I showed earlier. So since we didn't have built-in Wi-Fi, I thought maybe what we can do is bring our, in our own Wi-Fi bubble so the idea is that we could collect, collect data uh, that way uh, and have it automatically uh, be ready for, for pickup. So here's how this works. The head node uh, automatically when it boots up will uh, set up a, a Wi-Fi bubble. Now this is not Wi-Fi connected to the internet. It's just a, wi a local Wi-Fi network. When the sensor nodes boot up, they automatically attach to uh, this Wi-Fi bubble and start collecting data. The head node produces the Wi-Fi bubble, collects data. So all you have to do is turn these on. They automatically collect data. What the head node does automatically is it comes by and it pulls data from each sensor node and pools it in a central location for easy pickup. So the idea here Again, we were hoping to influence students to go to, the, to the, the site, whether it be a remote site or Heifer International. And so it's unfortunate now with uh, the, the uh, pandemic that it's kind of uh, held up this, this project. Hopefully we can return to this, but ideally we want students to, to go to the site with their cell phone and pick up the current data and then bring it back to either uh, home to analyze or into the lab or put it onto the internet manually, put this onto the internet uh, for everyone to analyze. So here is uh, the basic model that I was showing here. Set up uh, as a Wi-Fi hotspot. It does not have internet connectivity, but the sensor nodes connect to that. And so we can then come in inside this Wi-Fi bubble connect with our cell phone, collect the data. So this is another potential uh, area where we might influence students to get involved with this. 
uh, because that would give them the opportunity to collect interesting data uh, and go uh, to interesting places and do interesting things. So to wrap things up, the way we uh, influence students to get involved in this area is show the demand for the skill set. So that would be the, the money side. Also show opportunity to work with industry. And I've shown two different in industry groups that we're working with, and hopefully there'll be more industry groups that we can continue to work with. Also, I, I pointed out that uh, another opportunity here to get students involved is through the Student Signature Experience Grant, uh, and that's been successful as well. Also, I wanna point out the, the satisfaction of solving important tech problems. So there's the money side, but also there's the satisfaction side of this. I know that when I was an undergraduate, I thoroughly enjoyed the idea of solving tech problems. And hopefully that's what we can pr provide for our students is that satisfaction. So I want to thank Student Signature Grant, UA Little Rock, and Embry uh, funding uh, for this work. Thank you. I think this is another way to get students interested uh, because we're talking about building sensors to collect unique data and then apply machine learning to that unique data. So what I'm gonna do is talk about the two uh, required uh, data files. So the minimum for C5 uh, is the data file and the names file. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna use a simple little uh, lightweight application and we're gonna look at the very first line of this data file. So let me hit enter here and see if that, yeah. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is scroll back up. So this is the first line. This is only one line of data. So this is the data again that Hunter Tinner uh, had uh, collected on his uh, ethanol and acetone. So this is the very first piece of data uh, in, the, in the, the, the line. And I wanna show you the very last piece is the, uh, the known data type. So here we have ethanol. So this is the, the first line uh, for that shows ethanol, and I'm going to change head into tail. So this is just a lightweight Linux application. So now we're gonna look at the last line. It just ho so happens that uh, that one is acetone. So again, we have uh, the, all the measurements for this particular uh, case, and it's a known data type acetone. So that's what the data looks like in common delimited format. Now I'm gonna show you how we initialize that data and make it ready for uh, the, let me get the proper um, one here. I think I have it. Yes, here it is right here. So here's another lightweight application. So now what we're doing is talking about the initialization of these data types. So notice that I had in, in each one of those single lines, we had a value. So that value has a label. So this is the sensor, the MQ2 sensor, and this was the very number one uh, data collection for that sensor. So there's several of these of this very same um, sensor. And so this is uh, time series data. So they're collecting data from all these sensors over and over again, over time. And so let me just go through here Here's MQ2, three, on and on. So I'm gonna drive this down to the bottom of the file. So one thing I should point out is that what you see here top to bottom relates specifically to what I showed you previously from left to right. So at the top was the first uh, piece of data on the left and what is at the very bottom going to be the very last piece of data, which was the, uh, the class, the known class. So we have a variety of sensors, including humidity and pressure. And so we get down to the last piece of data. So we are initializing the, the last piece of data as being either uh, of class ethanol or acetone. Here we have the known classes. <clears throat> so now that I've shown you the two required data files, uh, we can do a machine learning run. So I'll just clear my screen and I'll just up arrow a few times, and here it is right here. This is a good one. So this is the uh, initial training 
we're going to determine, determine the training error. Okay, so it runs very quickly. Apparently, the computer's fast and the data is not very big. And so we see our very simple decision tree again because this is not a very challenging uh, bit of data uh, because acetone and ethanol are very different. Okay, and so these sensors can sort that out fairly easily, looks like. That's good. And so in training, there is no error. And so now it comes back to what we said was the most important part, which was the validation error. So I'll just recall that and do my capital X. And so what we're doing is we're converting the K fold into a leave one out. And so works fairly quickly. And so that was a live run of the validation run. You can see that 100% error. Since the leave went out, there's only one uh, inside that set to be um, predicted, and it was predicted to be uh, incorrectly. So it's data of known outcome. Uh, we applied the model to it, and it was incorrect. And so only one error, but the data set is fairly small. So that was a 4.5% uh, error. So that is essentially our confidence in this model to be able to sort out the difference between ethanol and acetone. Okay, so that was the, the demo uh, for the machine learning. I may be able to do, uh, let's see if I can do another demo uh, if you're interested. Uh, so my telephone is also uh, a, uh, an IoT device. And so what I can do is I've got, most of these phones now have uh, text-to-speech. And so what I can do is uh, actually have my phone speak to me uh, about some of the conditions uh, that are in, in real time. So uh, I kind of use the, the, the term freshness. So this is maybe fresh data. So let me see if I can set up my phone. Let me turn on my, my phone and see if I can do a demo and have the, the phone speak to you uh, of some of the, uh, the fresh data, as I call it. So let me stop share my screen to do a quick setup here, and I'll be right back. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen again. Let's see if I can get that uh, done properly. Okay, so what we're looking at is, uh, again, the server that I was using for the machine learning demo. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to log into my phone, just like it's a server. And so what I'm doing here is I'm going to SSH uh, into my phone. Uh, it uh, runs on port 8022. This is the IP address for my phone, so notice that uh, like many people, uh, when they get home, their phone would automatically connect to their Wi-Fi at home. Uh, and so uh, here, when I come to work, my phone automatically connects to the network uh, here at work. So what I have to do uh, is I have to go to my phone and turn on the application. So let's see if I hit enter here, let me get into the right spot. Yes. So now I'm logged into my phone. My phone is now an SSH server. And you can see there's quite a bit of diagnostic uh, information that comes out. So what I'm gonna do now is show you that there's some bio IoT data that I might like to keep up with. And that specifically uh, is in real time, the current condition of the pandemic uh, in terms of Arkansas. So a friend of mine is a mathematician. And so what he wanted to calculate is the, the ratio of COVID cases. <clears throat> so what we can do is get uh, a real-time count of the number of the positive cases in Arkansas, and we know the population of Arkansas, so we can make a ratio, okay? And so that was something that I followed. Now that we have the vaccinations, I'm interested in the vaccination rate. So if this works, uh, what we'll get is 
the ratio, and then uh, we will get the vaccination rate. So let's see if I can get this to work. Let's see if I've got that uh, here handy. Uh, yes, here it is, okay. So this is a program that I wrote. Let's see if it will talk to us. Takes a little time to initialize. Let's see what it'll do. Hopefully the server is gonna work. It's contacting a server. Coronavirus vaccinations in Arkansas is 6.1%. 6.1% it said. I did not know that because when I tested previously, it was less than that. So this changes not only on a daily basis, but from just a couple hours previously when I tested this. So uh, as we can see, the vaccination rate in Arkansas is going up. And I noticed that even when we were snowed in, this number continued to rise. So now, as I wrap this up, the question for me, and maybe for others as well, while this is sort of a toy, somewhat of a toy problem, I do think it's kind of important to, to keep track of vaccination rates. It might influence how I go about my day. The question here is, what is the most important thing that I need to know in real time? Thank you.